dear participants and guests, thank you very much for coming. It is both my duty and my pleasure to welcome you to our one-day conference, Perspectives of Integrated Austrian Theory. My name is Michael Oliver Cordoba and I am your conference host. The conference is organized on behalf of the Theory of Freedom Research Project in the Department of Philosophy in the University of Hamburg. And uh, we are delighted that my colleagues, where are they? From the University of Applied Sciences Europe, Master of Science Entrepreneurial Economics, hi Hendrik, uh, agreed to cooperate. So again, a warm welcome to you all. Let me kick off with some truisms well known in our circles. Austrian economics is a theory of human action. Praxeology is the methodology of Austrian economics. Well and good. But if Austrian economics is a theory of human action, what about the rest of economic theory? And if praxeology is the methodology of Austrian economics, why is it that it is so insufficiently understood? The first of these questions is easy to answer. Ever since economic theory fell under the spell of the natural sciences, it aimed at a reformulation of economic problems in as objective terms as perceived in the case of the natural sciences. Consequently, recalcitrant elements were left out of the equation or simply assumed away. Unfortunately, however, the determining aspects of human action, for instance, and in particular, economizing human action, like, for instance, providing for your old age, cannot be described completely in um, objective terms. They cannot be reduced to these either. So there is an essential and irreducible subjective element in human action, and to assume it away, like for instance, when comparing the behavior of traders to the behavior of molecules of a rare gas in a balloon, is to miss completely what is to be explained in the first place. So this is what distinguishes Austrian economics from the rest of the economic profession. Not that it aims at being a theory of human action, for every self-respecting economic theory should be, but that it confesses to subjectivism. This is the path-breaking insight the founder of this school of thought, Karl Menger, made. His insight was that value is not objectively given, not a matter of fact, not an intrinsic property of goods, but that it resides in an individual's subjective evaluation. I hope this comes back. Well, there it is. However, subjectivism is a wider phenomenon than Menger and virtually all of the later adherents of Austrian economics thought. And too little is understood of human action if it is just stipulated to be purposeful. This leads us to the answer to our second question. Why is praxeology so insufficiently understood? Well, my guess is that it is due to the timidity or unwillingness of Austrian economists to exceed the limits of their profession and to follow the example of the most notable praxeologist, Ludwig von Mises. Mises saw clearly that economics was part of a general theory of human action. He saw economizing action as a subset of acting in general. To the dismay of even his closest followers, however, Mises also notoriously held the view that many, if not all, essential insights into the nature of economics may be derived from studying this wider discipline, that of human action in general. It may well be that because they felt uneasy with this latter, frankly, quite controversial claim, that his followers remained skeptical concerning the former claim in the first place. So they threw the baby out with the bathwater. But clearly, the concept of action is not an economic concept. If praxeology correctly conceived, is the study of the concept of action and its implication, there is no alternative to exceeding the limits of economics in order to understand the fundamentals of economic theory better. Nevertheless, 
there remains a crucial question. It is, as Henrik Hagedorn writes, whether praxeology is actually also capable to account for complex phenomena. His talk, A Theory of Interest Rates, right after lunch, aims at answering this question in the affirmative. So will the last section of my opening talk, due in about eight minutes or so, uh, um, either. Actually, all of the talks we shall be hearing today deal with subjectivism in one way or another. Most of them apply it more or less directly to economic theory. Rolf Fuster, for instance, will inquire into the foundations of a theory of subjectivity in John Locke. Stefan Kurz, welcome will point to a crisis of mainstream economic thinking that might be overcome by rebuilding it from subjective value theory, I hope. Edith Pusta will take subjective value theory further and demonstrate its devastating implications for objectivism in ethics, if I understood correctly. And Edward Braun, where is he? Ah, okay. And Edward Braun will draw our attention to problems arising out of different notions of capital employed by Austrian school economists. Also, we will have a graduate presentation by Jeffrey Gilliam, I, um, which I am sure will fit in nicely. So, the conference might as well have been called Subjectivism and Economic Theory if it was not for the adhortatory element. Let us see if the whole will be more than the sum of its parts. Is there really a question? <laughs> If I only knew how to do it. Um, am I speaking too loud? Okay. Whatever seems appropriate. Um, I'm not a technical guy. So do as you please, but let me continue. So um, the interplay between philosophy and economics has too often been correctly described as in Paul Samuelson's sarcastic remark, quote, Take a little bad psychology, add a dash of bad philosophy and ethics, and liberal quantities of bad logic, and any economist can prove that the demand curve for a commodity is negatively inclined. Of course, the eminent economist forgot to second that with his very own recipe for disaster, and that would be my quotation. Take an interesting analogy, overstretch it with a lot of thermodynamics, add a dash of bad logic, and worse theory of science, do not forget liberal quantities of mathematics, and any economist can prove that under perfect competition, the maximum profit can, comes at that output where marginal cost equals price. Well, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Centered on a proper understanding of subjectivism and its place in economic theory, an integrated Austrian theory could make a difference and avoid these pitfalls. It is my hope that our meeting will contribute to that. Some last remarks by way of organization. For reasons I shall not go into now, the conference will be bilingual, as you are witnessing. Also, since the conference is strictly speaking an internal workshop with open doors, please understand that discussion among the participants is given due priority. We have not that before, and the initial idea was, let's have dinner together so that we get to learn each other uh, a bit better. Good idea, uh, but maybe we should give a presentation too, so we might get to know each other even better. Fine, let's do that. So that's how it started, and that's why we ended up with the present format. Also, please do not leave your personal belongings unattended at any time. The lecture hall will not be closed during breaks. Concerning breaks, there will be a 10-minute coffee break after every unit of talk plus comment, always 10 minutes before the hour. I shall see to that. So beware. During breaks, please help yourself to coffee, tea, water, and biscuits. If there are some, I hope there are. Outside breaks, please don't. We will have a lunch break at 2 p.m. in the cafeteria. Please make your individual arrangements there. And we will reconvene at 3 p.m. and have a closing discussion at 6 p.m. That will conclude the public part. But now, in the interest of time, without further ado and answering any questions, let me swiftly change hats and commence with the program. So thank you for that. A bit of technique, but we will continue in just a second. I hope that that's it. Mm -hmm. 
Are you fun? I, I don't know which one is working. I hope that's better. So, okay. Um, we're starting with my talk um, on the philosophy and logic of human action, and uh, the content is uh, fourfold. We'll have an introduction. I'll talk about, about this objective, a, a bit about the subjective and the objective, and I then will very briefly recapitulate, recapitulate the foundations of action theory, and in the end, I will put this to use for economic theory. That's the plan. So, let me start right off with the introduction. In the last century, the philosophy and logic of human action received a lot of uh, attention. In short, it is now safe to conclude that as a scientific discipline, action theory is a decent, well-established, and worthwhile field of study in its own right. It's not a shadowy kind of enterprise, not at all. How come this is reversed once we turn to the social sciences? Take economics. Apart from occasional fine words, the study of human action in economics really has a bad reputation. This is especially true of the most comprehensive and complete economic approach, praxeology, which emerged from the Austrian school of economics and antedated philosophical action theory by roughly the quarter of a century. In contrast to philosophical action theory, however, praxeology has a bad name indeed. How can this be? given, um, but, but how can it, can it be the case that, uh, as Paul Hamilton said, um, the study of human action in economics gives reason to tremble for the reputation of the subject? How can this be so if economics is, as Marshall put it, a study of mankind in the ordinary business of life and an examination of individual and social action? As always, the explanation is complex and perhaps largely historical. However, I shall not address this issue because it is not entirely clear whether the study of human action in economics is really well taken care of in the Austrian School of Economics in the first place. Clearly, there can be no doubt that, Austrian, that the Austrian School confesses to subjectivism, the central element in the explanation of human action. But this confession remains somewhat half-hearted. Austrians underline the importance of subjectivism in economics and economizing human actions, but they do not bother to ask about subjectivism and human action in general. It is the purpose of this talk to focus on these neglected aspects. We shall scrutinize subjectivism and human action in general. The proper general understanding, I believe, will resemble the general Austrian perspective very much. However, it must rest on very different foundations. On pain of circularity, a more general understanding of subjectivity and human action cannot be achieved within economic theory. Otherwise, it would not be more general. So the investigation ahead of us will and must be carried out in independence of the practical issues and the social sciences its results shall be applied to. Thus, no economic presupposition will be made use of. I hope in the end it will be seen that the philosophy and logic of human action has a lot to offer to economics and the social sciences. It will definitely be seen that it does so without compromising the rigor, richness, and respectability it deserves as a decent, well-established, and worthwhile field of study in its, uh, that it is. So, um, but, okay, now that. I now turn to the first part after the introduction, namely, the subjective and the objective, a fundamental distinction. So we are now stepping outside of economic theory, entering philosophy, and we, need, we have to do this. The distinction between the subjective and the objective has a very long tradition. The terms refer as far back as to Aristotle's categories, yet our modern understanding of the, these terms originates only in early modern times and is usually described as some sort of mind independence. The objective is independent of the mind, the subjective is not. But which are the elements that make the subjective and the objective thus and so? There are two options, the cognitive and the attitudinal. The cognitive pathway describes the element as a perspective or a view. Taking a subjective stance towards something would be to view it from a special perspective. 
the individual perspective of a subject. This is a powerful metaphor, but we will see it does not really lead us to the essence of the matter. More substance is found when we turn to the attitudinal pathway. There, we implicitly acknowledge the importance of the intentional, that feature of the mantle, another Austrian, if you will, Franz Quintano, took to be its very mark. And I have a long quote for you, which is uh, very important, I think. Every mental phenomenon is characterized by what the scholastics of the Middle Ages call the intentional or mental inexistence of an object, and what we might call, though not wholly unambiguously, reference to a content, direction toward an object, which is not to be understood here as meaning a real thing, or imminent objectivity. Every mental phenomenon includes something as object within itself, although they do not all do so in the same way. In presentation, something is presented. In judgment, something is affirmed or denied. In love, something is loved in hate, hated, in desire, desired, and so on. This intentional inexistence is characteristic exclusively of mental phenomena. No physical phenomenon exhibits anything like it. We can therefore define mental phenomena by saying that they are those phenomena which contain an object intentionally within themselves. The point Brentano was after later gave rise to the development of the theory of propositional attitudes. This is because in natural language we are familiar with a common feature that quite neatly exhibits what Brentano saw as defining feature of the mental. Recall that in natural language, we very frequently ascribe propositional attitudes to persons. For instance, we say that Tom believes that the earth is flat, or that Dick wants the man in the doorway to stop staring at him, or that little Harry hopes or fears that Santa Claus will come visit next Christmas. Believing, wanting, hoping, fearing, and others are propositional attitudes. They are mental states or events ascribed by reference to a person experiencing the mental state, and described by a sentence within the scope of a suitable attitude operator. More importantly in the present context, however, propositional attitudes exhibit the very important feature of intentional inexistence. This is the connection to the topic at hand. Someone can have a given attitude, even if the object aimed at does not exist, or is not the way he pictured, pictures it to be. For instance, the earth is not flat, I take it, yet Tom can believe it is. Or there is no Santa Claus, I believe, yet Harry can hope he, Santa Claus, will come visit next Christmas. Although attitudes need not have a real object, though they can, although attitudes need not have a real object by way of providing, so to speak, an internal object, they bring out the subjective view we, um, sorry, the subjective view of the attitude subject. In other words, by describing the attitudes, we describe the peculiar view Tom, Dick, and Harry have. We describe their subjective perspective. This gives us a characterization of subjectivity that both supersedes the metaphor of the eye and is <coughs> capable of incorporating it. The cognitively subjective, subjective is grounded in the attitudinally subjective. So the mind dependence defining the subjective turns out to be dependence on propositional attitudes. Thus we may say that the objective is so because it is independent of the propositional attitudes of the individual. And the subjective is so because it is not. The cognitive pathway leads to the attitudinal pathway and the attitudinal pathway leads to the proper understanding of the matter. Let us, for convenience, use AXP as a schematic expression replaceable by an adequate form of an attitude operator, the expression of an attitude subject, and an indicative sentence in correct order. Then we can describe subjectivity in a more general way and put it this way. This is criterion sub. Firstly, P does not entail AXP. Secondly, AXP does not entail P. Here is the key to reading the formulae. From the fact that Columbus discovered America, rendered here as P, 
it does not follow that he believed that he had discovered America, A hints P. Also, from the fact that George VI wanted to not succeed his brother to the throne, A X P, it does not follow that he did not succeed his brother to the throne, P. Actually, he did. This is not merely true. That's not the point about it. It is analytically contained in our understanding of the attitude verbs. No empirical knowledge was required. No history of America, no knowledge of American history or of uh, the history of the House of Windsor would be helpful or needed in order to understand that it does not follow. No empirical knowledge can disprove our criteria. So much for the empirical. In like manner, we may proceed with regard to the explanation of individuality for x unequal y, of course. <coughs> this is criterion int. Firstly, axp does not entail um, ayp, and secondly, ayp does not entail axp. Again, in order for you to read it, from the fact that Cleopatra feared that she be brought to Rome and paraded in the streets as part of Octavian's triumph, it does not follow that Octavian feared that Cleopatra be brought to Rome and paraded in the street as part of his triumph. Actually, he hoped for it. Also, from the fact that Odysseus hoped that Trojans would pull the wooden horse into their city, it does not follow that Laocoon hoped it. Again, all that is required is a proper understanding of the attitude verbs. No empirical knowledge would change that a bit. Our criterion is true in virtue of meaning. And, if I may add, still it is informative. Actually, a proper understanding of the semantics and logic of propositional attitudes exceeds the confines of time I have for this uh, talk. It even extends beyond this point and relates to the important issue of causation or strict causal determination, but for reasons of time, however, I cannot repeat what I have, what I have argued for in the paper. But we can summarize the whole of our findings um, in a brief and handy fashion. Once attitudes are both inferentially and causally independent both of the world they are about and of the attitudes of others. What is subjective is so because it is, dependent, because, because it is dependent on someone's attitudes. What is objective is so because it is not dependent on anyone's attitudes. This may not be all that could be said about the subjective, the objective and the interrelation, but whatever is said misses the mark if it does not ultimately conform to the present understanding. We dwelt in the philosophy of mind to grapple with the idea of intentionality. We saw it holds the key to understanding subjectivity, but now we must move on to the philosophy of action and even further to the theory of science and methodology. This is because our start starting point here is one about the application of decent and reliable scientific methods. And I start with an old idea um, brought up in modern times by Bernard Bolzano. Ever since Bernard Bolzano introduced it in his Wissenschaftslehre, which was 1837, the method of variation has been held in high esteem. It is widely regarded as a sound methodological tool for the derivation of concepts, categories, and functional units. Surely few linguists are aware of the illustrious past of the method of variation, yet they all are very well aware of their advantages. They quite commonly apply it both in theory and practice. For instance, when individuating distribution sets in order to derive linguistic categories like that of a phoneme or a morpheme, or when defining grammatical classes like that of a noun, verb, or adjective. As theoretical linguist John Lyons put it, quote, in this respect, modern linguistics has merely given recognition within the theory of grammar to the distributional principle by which traditional um, grammarians, sorry, um, by which traditional uh, grammarians were always guided in practice, unquote. So, to put it short, the method of variation is helpful, but more importantly, it may help us in the present context. This is because we are in need of a theoretically undemanding and transparent starting point for the philosoph philosophical study of human action. On the contention so common in action theory that the concepts and their interactions essentially <coughs> manifest themselves in action explanations, the method of variation can provide precisely the starting point we need. 
So understanding action reports holds the key to the understanding of the nature of action, but there is no need for an extensive analysis of corpora because we are all speakers of a natural language. Let us just settle for a classic example, for instance, one of Harry Frankfurt, very much discussed in action theory for other reasons. Spelled out completely, it reads before, sorry, the numbering is due to the paper and it is a much longer paper than the talk could be, so the numbering couldn't be adapted so quickly, sorry. Um, it reads before, Harry spills his drink because he wants his confederates to begin a robbery. Uh, he wants that his confederates begin a robbery, and he believes that if he spills his drink, this, his confederates begin a robbery. To identify the fundamental categories of action, all we need is to look at another instance, namely B5. Socrates drank the hemlock because he wanted to abide by his principles and believed that if he drank it, he would do so. Now, there is a reason why this is in color. You have to follow the colors in the next slide, sorry. But um, uh, the green uh, marked belongs together, the blue mark belongs together, and so on. I will, I will dwell on this in a, in a second. The general format of action explanations is recognized when we remind ourselves that B4 and B5 are variation instances of one another, and this gives the connection to the idea, the method of variation and the duration of functional units. Thus, variation should uncover the functional contrast involved in our basic understanding of action. This, in turn, amounts to detecting the very manifestation of the fundamental categories of action in our conceptual scheme. The first category, where Harry and Socrates, Mark Green, may be thought of substituting one another, can be singled out as the category allowing for questions of the type, who? For instance, who spills his drink, who drank the hamlock, and so on. We may take this for convenience as the category giving us the subject of action, traditionally called the agent. The second ca category, bye dear, the second category, um, Mark Magenta, where spills his drink and drank the hemlock substitute one another, can be seen as a category allowing for questions of the type, what does Harry, Socrates, or whoever? in the appropriate tense and mode, of course. The third and the fourth category of acting really are one, for they may be taken together as allowing for questions of the type, why or for what reason did he, whoever is being talked about, do what, what he did. Substitution renders them a couple, however, <clears throat> for we can think um, um, that one, uh, for we can think that on the one hand, he wanted to abide by his principles and he wants that his confederates begin a robbery, which is marked blue, substitute one another, and on the other hand, that he believes that if he spills his drink, his confederates begin a robbery, and he believed that if he drank it, he would do it, he would do so, marked orange, substitute one another too. Since in these substitutions, one element always remains preserved, it is very easy to name these categories as that of wanting and believing. So, very shortly, in a nutshell, in sum, the method of variation reveals four categories of action, agent, doing, wanting, and believing. It reveals them as a part of the very pre-theoretical and fun, uh, way we fundamental, fundamentally think about action. Now, note that the canonical form of action explanations not only manifests the fundamental categories of action, it also reveals their logical form. So with the help of a little apparatus, which is described in the paper, which I must presuppose here in the talk, it also, uh, uh, we may describe the nature of action in both general and formal terms as the logical semantic structure common to B4 and B5. So the common element of B4 and B5, which is here B. And it reads, <clears throat> X fights because X wants that P, and X believes that if he fights, then P. This embodies the very fundamental way we do understand the notion of action, although I give it to you that maybe we do not think of this fun fundamental way as the fundamental way, right? So uh, applying it as a fundamental, uh, fundamental way and being aware that it is the fundamental way are two very different things. Okay, but this embodies the very fundamental way we do understand the notion of action. So we may use B in a conceptual analysis of the notion of action, giving us the following analytical criterion. This is why I put the little definience uh, point. 
this is the criterion of action, x acts even only if x phi's because he wants that p and believes that if he phi's then p. So you see that on the right hand side it is just the common element of all action explanations which is being put to use. Again, for the philosophers amongst us, uh, I'm dwelling in what follows on the necessary part of it. I'm not going to discuss the, uh, the vegan, co uh, vegan cause of change and the, the sufficient part of it. Uh, in the end, I think uh, um, I will have good arguments for you to accept that it's both necessary and sufficient, but these arguments will lead us to a totally different sphere, and I'm not going to answer questions to this respect in the present context. So, put simply, what our criterion tells us is that acting is doing something for a reason. Well, this is philosophy. We sure knew this already. However, we have derived this in a way so that no dubious presupposition could secretly sneak in. This is the point about establishing sound and solid foundations. Of course, what we have achieved did not come out of the blue. It is methodological on a par with what linguists are praised for when deriving linguistic categories or what logicians employ when analyzing the logical structure of thought. Borrowing from John Lyons, we might have said that analytic action theory has merely given recognition to the distributional principle by which more traditional theorists were always guided in practice. To this we added nothing more than the essential tenets of the theory of intentionality, but because of the intentional, sorry, but because of the intentional nature of motivation, this was an essential part of the nature of action anyway. Still, it was necessary to make it explicit for reasons we will see later, but again, it rewarded us with making visible why human action must necessarily be conceived of in a subjectivist and individualistic way, precisely because of its intentional nature. In the end, our results depend on nothing but a fundamental understanding of intentionality and a distributional understanding of action explanations. So they were achieved wholly in the realm of philosophy. Note in passing, though, that those branches of philosophy that usually come into play when economists discuss the fundamentals of their subject, for instance, Kantianism and positivism, were neither needed nor would have been helpful at all. But now that we have, given, now that we have rigorous and respectable means at our disposal, <coughs> um, that were not derived from economics or any other social science, it is time to demonstrate their usefulness. And um, for want of space, this can be a sketch only. However, it will be a central problem of economics that I shall now turn to, namely the problem of competition. In the end, you might say, but sorry, uh, the prologue was needed. So now we turn to the uh, study of human action economics, but building on the fundamentals which I have sketched before, okay? That's a very different foundation. The idea of pure competition is, a f is fundamental for the understanding of modern economics. It is also a very problematic idea requiring many and strong auxiliary assumptions. But I cannot go into this in the present occasion. I dwelt, uh, I, gave, I gave you a whole chapter in the paper underlying the talk about pure competition. At any rate, the idea of pure competition came up as an effort to understand more precisely the ultimate ground of, two, uh, of truth of two very popular and plausible classical propositions. One was Adam Smith's contention that the greater the number of seller, the lower the price. The other was John Stuart Mill's assumption that there can be only one price in the market. It was the aim of the forefathers of general equilibrium theory to render, to render these assumptions truisms and to do so in a mathematically convenient way. The understanding econometrists sought to refine in which they came to replace instead, unfortunately, um, usually made reference to man's behavior. So here we are back with our topic of the study of human action in economic theory. However, under the influence of the general equilibrium picture, the traditional understanding of competition eventually escaped the economist's attention, and today it is almost exclusively mentioned in, in, in historical retrospect. Yet it is very well capable of casting light on important features of economic theory that should no, not go unnoticed, as will I, uh, will I try to show to you. Let us remind ourselves that 
competition is marked by an element of rivalry. This understanding is so much taken for granted that in many textbooks it is mentioned more or less in passing. Sometimes, however, it is stated very clearly, as in Menkert and Taylor, quote, competition exists um, when two or more firms are rivals for customers. How are we to make sense of this idea without introducing strong assumptions of the kind the equilibrium theorist is compelled to make? Our minimalist philosophy and logic of action set out in the first part of this talk will uh, help us out. Clearly, to trade with someone is to act. So everything we said about acting applies for trivial reasons. Given, for instance, that Tom and Dick trade a sheep for a goat, what is involved when they make the deal may be described as follows. At least as follows. Maybe, it's not, maybe there is more going on, but at least the following is going on too. A, Tom gives Dick his sheep. B, Dick gives Tom his goat. C, Tom wants that Dick gives him his goat. D, Dick wants that Tim give, Tom gives him his sheep. E, Tom believes that if he gives Dick his sheep, then Dick gives Tom his goat, and Dick believes that if he, if he gives Tom his goat, Tom gives him his sheep. Right? So that's a simple exchange, in a way, um, untied uh, the action theoretic uh, features it, it, it must necessarily involve. Okay? This can, be put a, uh, this can be put a bit more precise as TD, which stands for Tom and Dick, no mystery involved, uh, which, and this is important, is an instance of B, the logical form, the, 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 the common, common feature of action explanations. Okay? A and B because C and D and E and F. So I have to abbreviate because otherwise we'll get quite a mouthful. Um, and TD being a, so to speak, collective instance of B, um, and you can see it if you put it below, um, B read X files because X wants that P and X believes that X, if it's X files, then P. Well, we have A and B um, and because C and D and E and F, and the colors will lead you to uh, understanding that if you read it out, if you read it out, sorry, then uh, you would see that um, the very same concepts and notions are involved that are uh, explicit in B, right? So, Clearly, up to now, no trace of uh, uh, business rivalry is found. To make a further step in this direction, let us imagine an alternative situation. Tom is still willing to trade his sheep, but now there is another trader, Harry. This gives us a variant of TD, namely TH, standing for Tim, Tom and Harry. Again, no mystery involved. And now we have the idea of Harry's Yama in exchange for Tom's sheep. And it gives us a very s similar logical structure underlying it, namely Tom gives Harry his sheep, Harry gives Tom his Yama, Tom wants that Harry gives him his Yama, Harry wants that Tom gives him his sheep, Tom believes that if he gives Harry his sheep, Harry gives him his Yama, and Harry believes that if he gives Tom his Yama, Tom gives him his sheep. Again, this can be rendered as an instance of B, namely TH, G and H because I and J and K and L, okay? As I said, neither TD nor TH nor their conjunction gives us business rivalry. The essential step comes from the theory of intentionality, again. We must take the attitudes into account the assumed competitors have towards these possibilities because up to now, TD and TH are mere possibilities. We're not assuming that one of the exchanges has taken place. There are, so to speak, in the logical realm, right? And now if we envisage these exchanges as possible exchanges, and now focus on the attitudes that the uh, presumptive competitors have towards these possibilities, we are getting uh, uh, on the trace of what uh, business rivalry consists in. So, um, the essential step, as I said, comes from the theory of intentionality. We must take the attitudes into account the assumed competitors have towards these possibilities, and that is what makes them competitive competitors in the first place. Appreciating that is, is, is sorry, appreciating I need to have a water here for the next speaker, I will, shall see to that. Appreciating that it is essential to introduce an intentional element to explain rivalry is a near truism. 
What makes two runners run a race is not that they are speedily moving in towards the same direction. So many men do that every day without running a race. Right? Rather, it is the fact that the one wants to outperform the other. So they have attitudes towards each other. Now, we could stick with the attitude of wanting and believing. However, I think that more realism is added when we make use of two other propositional attitudes instead. So let us describe the essential step by adding that Dick hopes that he will make the deal, but fears that Harry might close it, and vice versa. Harry hopes that he will make the deal and fears that Tom might close it instead. Thus, we may say that if Dick hopes and fears so, and Harry hopes and fears the converse, they see each other as business rivals. We may also say further that if due to this they act accordingly, they are business rivals. So a formal rendering would be PR. Harry hopes, sorry, Tom hopes that uh, he will close the deal, TD, right? I, I'm not going to remind you of what TD consists of. I hope you have it more or less present in your mind. And what we see is, sorry, that, again, where am I? Where am I? I am here. No, no, it's too far. Uh, we, uh, what is in PR is Tom and Harry have converse and antagonistic attitudes, so to speak, right? H is for hoping, F is for fearing, and um, Tom fears that hopes that he will make the deal and fears Harry might make it, and Harry fear, hopes that he will make the deal and fears Tom might make it. So if this is the case, then um, Tom and Harry perceive each other as business rivals. And we also have a rendering of what would be an antagonistic behavior, namely uh, where Tom Chais Highest prime because in, in, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of variables. Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, um, where Harry uh, does uh, uh, Tom does something because he wants that he closes the deal and Harry doesn't, and believes that if he does that, he closes the deal and Harry doesn't. And again, Harry does something else. This is high two or high two prime. Um, um, uh, um, he does something because he uh, wants that uh, he closes the deal and that Harry doesn't, uh, that t uh, Tom doesn't, <coughs> and believes if he does what he does, uh, he will close the deal and Tom doesn't. So that's antagonistic behavior, which is not to be equal, but which is an element of rivalry. Now, where comes rivalry really into place? An action is rivalrous, rivalrous behavior if and only if the relation between P, R, and and is such that seeing each other as rivals is the reason of acting in antagonistic manner. Do I have it here? Yes. Okay. And an action is a competing even only if it is an instance of rivalrous behavior. What might high one and high two be? For instance, Dick might offer Tom a discount or some other gratification. Harry might offer Tom special trade relations or immediate delivery. If that is, is what they do because they want to make the deal and do not their rival to close it, that is what their acting competitively amounts to. Now, I'm running out of time and I'm hurrying and speeding and, uh, uh, up very much. Uh, so, um, looking back at our, uh, our solution, we might be tempted to conclude again, sure, this was known before. What we did not know beforehand, however, was that this understanding draws on analytic action theory only. Consequently, there was no need and actually, actually no room either for something only remotely resembling an equilibrium picture of perfect competition. I did not criticize it. I just left it out. And this is an asset. Explaining competition cannot be achieved within a market structure approach because the equilibrium approach leaves out what is essential to competition, human behavior. Explaining competition as rivalry dissolves this mystery because rivalry is essentially a form of human behavior. And as such, it inherits the feature of intentionality. Traditionally, economics has focused on understanding prices, 
competitive ma markets and their interaction. If studying human action in the way undertaken here made a substantial contribution to the explanation of competition, as I hope it does, it surely demonstrated the use of the philosophy and logic of human action in the application to the social sciences. Also, it did so at the very heart of economics because competition is surely at the center of economic theory. Of the consequences of the approach sketched, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding up, sorry, too much. Of the consequences of the approach sketched, I can, just, you just, I can just give you a hint. Really, they would amount to almost a complete repeal Sorry, uh, uh, they would amount to a, almost a complete repeal of any antitrust le legislation, which only the pro prohibition of state aid and the removal of government barriers to entry left. This is because what drives competition is not um, the number of sellers nor any other feature, objective feature of market structure. No objective feature could do that. What drives competition is intentional, the fear of losing business and the hope for still somehow securing it. So the most expensive and time-consuming activity of the European Commission and similarly uh, regula regulatory bodies, namely concentration control and prohibition of cartels and so on, appears conceptually compromised uh, and uh, virtually unfounded. Also, the need for state monitoring the economy, which is built in in general equilibrium theory, is unmasked as being neither necessary nor useful for restoring equilibrium and protecting the common good. The case could even be made that nothing, that nothing could be a better promotion of the common good than to restrict government intervention to the protection of life, liberty, and the state of the individual. This is the sense in which John Locke aimed at confining the limits of state power. Modern economics in, um, provided the state with a justification to extend its limits in a way unprecedented in human history. It did so at the cost of effectively transmuting into a well-subsidized interventionist state ideology. The study of human action in economics could have avoided that, but it seems that it, that it is precisely for this reason that it has the odds stacked against it. Thank you very much. There will now be a brief comment, and uh, again, um, a very brief comment, uh, and then we will have a coffee break 10 minutes before the hour. So, Stefan, if I uh, may uh, ask you to be very brief, thank you again. Well, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, talk, a perfect introduction also to the whole conference, I would say. Um, well, when I went through the paper and through the first half of the paper, I was very deeply impressed um, how deep one can dig into something that most economists don't even think about or take for granted or consider only superficially or at best implicit. Because what we typically do is a more or less axiomatic approach by starting with man X, full stop, and what follows from it. But what is behind the action itself is more or less, well, um, at the disposal of the individual researcher and his imagination. So, uh, thank you very much for making so many implicit aspects of the concept of human action explicit. And by explaining quite um, clearly why subjectivism and individualism cannot be detached from human action. So what you heard is, well, human action involves an agent, something about doing, then wanting and believing. And well, the, the, the agent thing and the doing thing is quite um, straightforward, I would say. Um, what might be interesting is to ask questions, well, where does the wanting come from? What are the determining factors of wanting? And if we translate the wanting into this language of economists, we would typically name it preferences, right? So are the preferences truly exogenous or not? Second, believing, well, I would translate this as an economist, this is all about speculation. And you know that economists treat this as a technical term. In the public debate, speculation is something which comes with a very, very negative connotation, but speculation just means, well, I don't have perfect knowledge, 
but I have to start from somewhere, so I'm speculating. I'm starting from a hypothesis. I'm believing something or not. So this has a lot to do with imperfect knowledge. And one of the most important hypotheses that we must set up in a market economy is about the preferences of others. In a society that is set up, or in a, an economy that is set up on the division of labor, we have to know what other people's preferences are, or at least have a guess about that. So these are core concepts of economics that is also addressed by wanting and in particular believing. And what I found interesting is that, well, humans act, but they do not act in isolation. Um, you very much, in the first half of the paper, focused on the individual as an actor or as an agent. But what happens if people coordinate their action in a marketplace? Uh, what does this mean to what you call the attitudes or the mental state? Of course, I could believe that the world is flat, but isn't there, there a social mechanism in a free, open society that people kind of converge with their beliefs towards what is, well, what proves better in their business success, for example? Um, so th this is an interesting field of research in the area of the social science. What happens when people form their preferences and their speculation, not in isolation, but in an interchange with each other? So we have market interaction, we have feedback processes, we have learning. So this might be an interesting field for um, further research and maybe even reduce this, what you, what you call the intentional inexistence. Uh, maybe we are kind of, um, well, narrowing down on what you can make um, well, um, it, it's not at the, dis of course you are free to believe whatever you want to believe, but there are incentives in a market process not to believe any nonsense. Uh, but to correct yourself once you find out that you're doing something stupid. So this is what I would call the intersubjective coordination via market exchange. And of course, the application was very well chosen to talk about competition. Very brief remarks here. You reconstructed rivalry as what is really at the core of the competitive process in a market economy. Absolutely perfect that you um, sentences that I like most was perfect competition is on perfection, not on competition. And economic agents are pictured in mainstream general equilibrium economics. Economic agents are pictured as maximizers of profit whose performance is optimal when there is none. This very clearly describes the dilemma of competition policy. We have just sweep out the whole concept of competition. My remark would be refer to Kirzner's competition and entrepreneurship because um, most of what you are uh, rightfully so are describing in this, uh, uh, in this chapter um, has already been developed by him in this uh, contribution which is an it's an, like, like an outbreak uh, of competition policy in, or of, of the concept of um, competition, a reconstruction of the com competition um, concept in the Austrian school, and therefore I think he should get his uh, fair um, um, part in that. Um, I'm not so sure, maybe you're overemphasizing the Pareto. Um, um, guideline. Um, in my understanding, Pareto optimality is not so much about a state, but more about a direction. So saying that if one person owns all resources and all the others own nothing, yes, this is Pareto optimal. But typically, economists are not interested in this state of things, but rather what could we do to improve things. So it's rather um, a guideline uh, for change and not a description of a state. Um, I 
absolutely agree with you that competition policy is problematic if we start from a structural approach, 100% on your side. On the ha other hand, things become more problematic once we talk about, well, what are these property rights that the lean state is expected to guarantee? There is no black, white picture of property rights. It's always a grayscale picture and therefore saying we don't need any regulation or any framework setting uh, from the government is too easy because whatever you do or not do as a government has implications for property rights and um, I'm again very much in your camp when it comes to this interventionist um, attitude, uh, the belief that the bureaucrats in the government and administration can know better about what the competitive outcome will be than the competition process itself. Absolutely on your side, but on the other hand, we must be sure not to say, well, everything that has to do with antitrust and competition policy and the framework is all unnecessary. We just need a simple framework. We have to guarantee property rights, but this question must also answer further questions. What kind of property rights are we talking about? What is the design, the optimal design, if there's some of property rights? And here again, I would say no one can know that. We have to be prepared for a process here of trial and error again. The property rights will emerge um, out of our experiences that we make with it. And probably Europe is much better equipped with its variety that we so far have just to test out more frameworks rather than have one institution that sets the framework for everyone in the whole economic area of the European Union. So here, more discovery processes would be necessary to find out what the best design of property rights is because no one can tell this from, um, uh, from stretch, from the, from the desk. Well, so much my very brief comments on an excellent paper. Thank you very much. <laughs>